the Korean Research Institute Distinguished Scholar Series. Uh, this is, I think, the second in our talks this year. And just by way of reminder, uh, the next one, which is coming up sometime in November, I um, always like to give a little preview, is Dr. Evan Eichler from the University of Washington in Seattle, who'll be talking about genetics of autism. And I think Paula may have his flyers that are there for those of you interested in coming to hear next uh, month's talk. So without further ado, it's a really great pleasure to welcome uh, a friend and a colleague uh, to uh, Virginia Tech Carillion, Dr. Marsha Malik from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Marsha is uh, the director of the Weissman Center, who probably many of the people in this room are familiar with. Some of you may not be. Uh, it is one of the premier, if not the premier, center in the United States uh, for working at all levels uh, with children and, and adults with um, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities. And they have wonderful research programs, wonderful clinical service education program. It's just an incredible uh, facility and place for amalgamating uh, intellectual horsepower and great ideas and technology that deliver services and, and lead to a lot of discoveries. And so Marcia is the director of that program, a very important program. She also served uh, recently in the last year or two as the interim director of the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery, which I just learned about a little bit today talking to her, which sounds like a phenomenal uh, place to the tune of several hundred million dollars of investment to do some really creative things, which tells you the esteem she is uh, held in by the institution to take on that important role. Uh, Marcia um, is also uh, the uh, uh, professor, the uh, Elizabeth Boggs and uh, Vaughn Bascom professor as well, endowed professorship. Uh, she did her PhD at Brandeis University in social welfare. Uh, she joined the faculty on uh, sociology and social work at Boston University, where she was uh, a faculty member, I think an assistant and associate professor, and uh, also affiliated with their gerontology center. Uh, and then she went to the University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison, where she became a professor. Uh, in uh, social work initially, and then in 2002 took on the leadership position uh, at the Weissman Center uh, for another, after another uh, previous director of that center, Terry Dolan, who many of us knew, one of the real uh, giants in the field as well. So she walked into big shoes and filled them uh, very well and went way beyond uh, where they had been. Uh, she also has been appointed as a professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin. Um, she has won a lot of awards, uh, and, and what's really interesting, you look at CVs of very senior people all the time, you see the awards and so forth, but what's really interesting about uh, Marsha's uh, curriculum vitae with respect to awards is they come from a, a broad range of areas. So she's won the, I don't want to say the usual awards, I don't want to trivialize, she's won a number of awards for her academic achievement uh, as a research scholar and so forth, but she's also won awards from, for community service and for really reaching out uh, to delivering uh, things to the community on intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. She won the uh, uh, Puchel Memorial Award for Down Syndrome uh, Congress. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Gerontological Society. Uh, she's won the Distinguished Research Award from the ARC, the Lodge Memorial Prize from Adelphi University, uh, and a number of others. And she also serves on editorial boards of a number of important journals, the Journal of Mental Health Research and Intellectual Disabilities, Developmental Disabilities Research Reviews, uh, Family Relations, uh, American Journal of Mental Retardation. She also has served as the director of the Intellectual Disabilities Research Centers uh, Association. And I had the great privilege uh, years ago to uh, be directing a, another center in intellectual disabilities and serving in that similar role. That's when I really got to know Marcia and her work and developed a, a very abiding respect, not only for her contribution scientifically and her service to the community, uh, but also for her uh, leadership skills uh, as well, which are, which are pretty spectacular, honestly. Um, she, uh, the position she has, the endowed professorship and so forth, just by way of background, I'm going to mention this is old hat to people know Wisconsin but it comes from something called the Wisconsin Alumni Research Fund, WARF. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, uh, organization. It, it is a, an organization at the University of Wisconsin that has invested something to the tune of a billion or two billion, uh, who's counting after a billion dollars, into the University of Wisconsin from a number of major achievements in intellectual property and development of technology. And of course, the name many of you are familiar with from Warfarin, which was originally developed as uh, a rat poison, basically. It's a blood thinner Coumadin and led to uh, tremendous uh, growth in the uh, economic uh, uh, technology enterprise there. But originally started with a major discovery with respect to vitamin D and rickets. And uh, it's really interesting in the context of developmental disabilities in children that that's where that program started. 
And, and lastly, before I let Marcia come up, I just want to say a couple words ab about her work. Uh, her work has touched uh, families and all sorts of levels, and she's really filled some really important voids where you look at the literature and the history uh, of working with uh, families and children with autism spectrum disorders, with fragile X syndrome, Down syndrome. Um, and she, she has taken a very, very uh, scholarly approach to, to identifying very critical gaps in her understanding the longitudinal development uh, of individuals uh, and families that they interact with. And she found, I think, very early on that there was just a, uh, some really big gaps in our beginning to look at what happens when people uh, graduate from high school, for example, have been on a very positive trajectory otherwise, and then that trajectory is affected when they leave that group. Uh, she has compared in a very rigorous way uh, individuals and families uh, with respect to Down syndrome, Fragile X syndrome, autism spectrum disorder, uh, and a variety of psychiatric illnesses to make sure appropriate parametric control, control groups are there to understand uh, what goes on with individuals um, as they uh, grow through adolescence and into adulthood. And uh, that work has really, I think, led to a revolution. Uh, not only in, in Marsh's field, in the field of understanding behavior and family dynamics and sociology and psychology and neuroscience, but it has given a lot of information to people at kind of the other end of the research spectrum in terms of neuroscience and biology as well uh, to begin to look at that work and to try to frame a lot of the questions they address in the context of Marsh's discovery. So she really is a giant in the field in that respect, and I'm really excited to have her here today. And please join me, join me in welcoming Dr. Marsha Malik. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, really very, very generous. Thank you for inviting me here, and thank you all for being here. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Um, I've had a wonderful day today. It's just been terrific conversation, really exciting to be in a new, a new institute at a new medical center and um, to meet the community. So it's, it's really it's great to be in the very beginnings of the, um, a, a, a wonderful evolution that I know that you will, you will all um, enjoy over the coming years and decades. Uh, the Weisman Center, which I direct, is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary. So, you know, when you think about the beginnings and then you think about last, uh, creating an environment that has lasting value and a sustained mission and that evolves over the years and the decades. So, you know, the beginning and then continuing is two different perspectives. Um, so, I thought today I would talk a bit about Fragile X Syndrome and use that as a way to um, think about the impact of genetics um, uh, on a family. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to stand so I can see all of you. <laughs> I'm height challenged. <laughs> um, so how many of you know what Fragile X Syndrome is? Some people. And does anybody have a family member or know a, someone in the community? Okay, well, I'll try to provide some clinical description so you can get a sense for what Fragile X Syndrome looks like. I have some movies that... Um, of kids and adults with Fragile X Syndrome, and then talk a bit about, um, I hope we can engage in a dialogue about some of the um, challenges that society faces when um, there are um, conditions like Fragile X, which are um, inherited conditions. So um, these two boys in the picture have their brothers, they have Fragile X Syndrome, and they have some of the characteristic features, which um, two of which are a long, narrow face and um, larger ears. Um, and there are other features, but one of the characteristics of Fragile X is that not all people with Fragile X have all of the comorbid conditions or have, um, at, that there's a great deal of um, variability and severity. So it's a very heterogeneous condition, even though it's caused by a single gene mutation. So let me say a bit about prevalence, because, you know, we have to think about this in the context of society. So Fragile X is a relatively rare disorder, and the best estimates, which are only estimates, is that one in 4,000 males and one in 6,000 females have Fragile X syndrome. And the reason why there are only estimates is that it's significantly underdiagnosed. We don't do mandatory screening for Fragile X syndrome. Um, and we'll come back to that point um, later on. The, the mutation in the gene that causes Fragile X is much more prevalent than the full syndrome. And when you th think about um, one in about uh, 450 males and one in about 150 females have been found to have what's known as the pre-mutation um, of Fragile X, and that's the state of the mutation where 
w before it passes into the full mutation state, and we'll talk more about this. I'm not going to talk a lot about the genetics in a um, basic science, from a basic science perspective, because this is a, a general um, audience, but I'm happy to talk, um, to answer questions if you'd like. The, the, the gene becomes, becomes unstable um, um, at a point that we're in a, in a region called the gray zone. And one in 12 women and one in about 23 men have instability in this gene. And so if you think about this across generations, and we will do that, there are people, um, and when you think about how many people are in this room, that one in 12 women have instability in this gene. And over the cor course of a certain number of generations, the number is not known, that instability can expand um, to the premutation um, level. And once it's at the premutation level, certain genetic events happen and there's a high, high risk of having a child with the full syndrome. And so although the full syndrome is rare, the instability of this gene is quite prevalent. And then you start asking questions about what point does a prevalent genetic condition, is that normal? It's just in society, it's just in the population. At what point does it become clinically significant and what should we do about that? Um, so this is a family and I'm going to put this pedigree up again later on, but just to point a couple things out, for those of you who are not used to pedigrees, you have, you know, the women are circles and the, the females are circles and the um, males are squares, and you have this couple, Charlotte and Cooper, which of course are not their names, and they had four kids and they didn't suspect that anything was different about their family, and then, and neither did anybody in the second generation, and in the third generation, you start having children who are diagnosed with fragile X syndrome. And the child in our study is the one with the arrow. And in the fourth generation, all four great-grandchildren have, are affected by fragile X, well, three by fragile X and one by um, the premutation of fragile X. And so you could see how it cascades through the family. But it's invisible until a child is diagnosed. And there are many, many families in our community where children might have mild symptoms they, and they are not diagnosed with fragile X syndrome, um, but yet the, in, in, there's increasing risk in subsequent generations. And this raises all, so, all sorts of questions, bioethical questions, and, um, and questions about family planning. So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the genetics and characteristics of fragile X and associated disorders. I have some case examples and some movies, as I mentioned. Oops, sorry. And then more generally, I want to talk a bit about um, the issues of genetics that we need to grapple with as a society as we learn more and more about our genes and big, big policy level decisions that have to be made. So a little bit about Fragile X. Um, although in most people um, who are not connected with medical centers um, or research centers don't know about Fragile X, it is the most common inherited cause of intellectual disability, what we used to refer to as mental retardation. Inherited meaning passed from parent to child. Down syndrome is the most common genetic cause of intellectual disability, but that's not inherited. Um, that's a sporadic condition. And it's easy to diagnose fragile X syndrome. You could take a blood sample and diagnose it, or a saliva sample, but it's severely underdiagnosed. And the characteristics of fragile X are listed on the slide. Um, developmental delay, um, social anxiety, seizures in some kids, speech and language deficits, um, being hypersensitive to sensory stimuli, sounds, lights. Um, about a third of the kids with fragile X have severe aggression, um, severe enough to have injured their caregivers and, and had their caregivers need to seek medical attention in the past year. Um, some flap, hand flapping is pretty common, motor stereotypy, and it's the lar largest single known cause of autism, although it's not the same as um, autism in the absence of fragile X. But a large number of children with fragile X syndrome also have a co-occurring diagnosis of autism. And so this is some data from a, um, our colleague Don Bailey, who's um, at, um, in North Carolina. And he, he's, he did a very large um, national parent survey of um, uh, fragile X um, syndrome and uh, um, associated disorders. And this shows some prevalence data on each of those symptoms that I mentioned. If you um, think about the fact that in, um, well, in females, the symptoms are, are less severe than in males, and we'll talk a bit about why. But you see that in um, males, almost 80% have attention problems, and 62% of the females do. About 60% of the males have hyperactivity, and about half that many females. About 35% of fragile X children with fragile X syndrome, um, as I mentioned, have se se severe aggression, again, half that number of females. And so it goes. Um, about 43% of the males have autism versus 
uh, sorry, 16% of the females, but 95% of males have developmental delay and 65% of females have developmental delay. So there's a significant um, number of co-occurring conditions and they're, they're, they're severe co-occurring co conditions in Fragile X syndrome. So why are females more um, mildly affected? It has something to do with what we call activation ratio. And in all females, two X chromosomes, um, but only one X chromosome is active um, in each cell or turned on in each cell, and that's a random process. So on average, about 50% of one X chromosome and 50% of the other is turned on. But there is, you know, in any um, biological phenomenon, a range so that for some people, a vast majority of the X chromosome, one X chromosome is turned on, whereas an, uh, for other people, the vast majority of the other X chromosome is turned on. And if it happens in, and in women who carry the mutation, either in the gray zone or the premutation range or the full mutation, um, if the majority of cells are those where the mutation is, is on the, when the mutation is on the X chromosome that's turned on in the majority of cells, then the symptoms are more severe, whereas if the mutation is um, turned off in the majority of cells, through this random process, the symptom is less severe. So in women, it's sometimes the case that you don't even know that they have Fragile X syndrome, even though they have the full mutation of Fragile X, if they have mo mostly their normal X chromosome um, turned on. Whereas in other women, it can be a very severe manifestation of the disorder. And this makes genetic counseling very challenging because when, you, when a couple finds out that they have, they're carrying a baby with Fragile X syndrome, and this happens occasionally, and it's a girl, then they don't know whether to expect someone who's going to have very significant disabilities or someone who has very, very mild disabilities. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a movie that was um, provided to us by Dr. Elizabeth Barry Kravis, who's at Rush, and she has a wonderful, huge practice um, taking care of children with Fragile X Syndrome. And my goal here is to give you a sense of the range of impairments from mild to severe in males and females, and watch for evidence of the symptoms that I mentioned um, earlier, and you'll see these in these four kids. It's for babies? Yeah. We don't have to play with that. It's babies. I'm oh, headache. I'm sorry. I'm How are you? Are you headache? Mm -mm. Are you sick? No. Why not sick? I'm healthy. I like to be healthy. Are you sick? Uh -uh. What are you doing? So I haven't had the chance to learn much about you, so now I would like us to sit and talk together so that I can get to know you a little better. That's fine. I'd like us to talk for about 10 minutes or so. That's fine. So your mom told me that you like pools with water slides? Yes. Well, that sounds interesting. I do. Tell me about them. I like the water slide or the swimming and the wine, slide it down a little bit. Now we're going to look at the book again. Okay. But this time I want you to tell me the story. I don't want it. Tell me everything about the story for each page. I'm on the hall right now. Tell me the whole story and then we're all done. Oh, God. How does the story start? I don't know. Why don't I have it? No. 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 Oh, no. What about the boy? He's walking. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the frog doing? How does the story start? It starts when this little boy and the dog and the turtle and the frog go to the park. And so I'm looking at the um, butterfly. So it was a dog, and the kid is looking at the. So you see just oops, tremendous range of abilities um, in these four kids. And I think I was struck by the fact that this does express the full, the full range of the, um, almost the full range of the, um, of the uh, phenotype of Fragile X Syndrome. And the, the, I have two more movies to show you. They're going to actually show you more severe phenotype. But you know, this girl, you would never pick out as having you know, difficulty. She launched right into the storytelling task. And, and then the other girl was much less communicative. And um, the two boys were very different as well. But um, um, even though uh, Fragile X Syndrome is often accompanied by many, many um, co-occurring conditions, 
it's not an easy, it's not a diagnosis that's made, let's say, like Down syndrome in the um, delivery room. It takes up to four years to diagnose Fragile X syndrome, and those are valuable years in the developing life of a child and the development of the brain. And so this is a slide that shows the fact that we're not making any progress in changing the, or, or, de, or making the age of diagnosis younger and younger. So the bottom, the bottom um, row in this, the bottom This is. That was the best one. <laughs> okay. So this, bo this bottom row on the graph shows the um, first concern expressed by, by someone, usually a doctor or a parent, about the child's development. And you see that that happens at little, in 2001, kids who were born in 2001, it happened a little bit below 12 months of age before their first birthday. And over the subsequent years, that, that, that actually has been improving, that now the first concern is expressed, you know, more like six months. And do doctors are doing much more developmental screening than they did, you know, more than a decade ago. The second row um, is showing you the, um, when there's been a workup to, delay, to show, to confirm that this child has delayed development. And in 2001, that didn't happen until, um, you know, almost two years of age. Um, and now that's quite a bit younger. It's um, at around 20 months of age. And then the third um, set of data shows you when the child re began to receive services. And there is some improvement in that, that as well, where children are now receiving services quite a bit younger than, um, than they did um, years earlier. But there doesn't seem to be much progress in when actually the child is diagnosed with having fragile X syndrome. We're talking about three or more years until the child gets the diagnosis. So you can imagine what happens in the life of a family during three years after the birth of a child. There's often another child born. Um, Consequently, in about 29 to 30 percent of families who have one child with Fragile X syndrome, they have another child with Fragile X syndrome. Sometimes they have more than two um, children with Fragile X syndrome, three or four. So I'll tell you about one family in, who we, took, we take care of in our center. Um, the parents had two sons, and one of them had autistic-like behaviors and was sent to the Weisman Center for an autism diagnosis, and he did meet diagnostic criteria for autism. And the... Um, developmental pediatrician who worked him up recommended that they go for Fragile X um, testing. Parents really didn't want to do a blood draw um, because they, they didn't want to cause their child any more distress, and so they figured they would wait until there was another need for blood to be drawn for this child, and then they would do the genetic test for Fragile X. And in the meantime, the mom became pregnant and had a third child, and then the first child ended up having some kind of me medical procedure that had to be done, and so they did do the blood draw, and they diagnosed that child with Fragile X syndrome, and then they tested the other two siblings, and all three of them have Fragile X. And, you know, these are great parents. Um, it wasn't like they were resistant to medical care or advice, but they're, also, they're dealing with a child who has auti an autism diagnosis. Drawing blood from a child with autism is challenging, and you don't want to cause any more distress. It's a whole series of trade-offs. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the situation that I think lots of families find themselves in, is that they end up being, finding out that their ch child has fragile X after they've had a second child or a third child, and sometimes those kids are affected too. And everyone agrees that there's a need for early diagnosis of fragile X syndrome, so services can start being provided um, sooner. But n there is disagreement in terms of whether there should be mandatory newborn screening for fragile X. There's a lot of reasons why people think that it shouldn't be. We can come back to that. There's even more disagreement about whether there should be prenatal screening for Fragile X for all the obvious reasons that accompany prenatal screening and preconception screening as well. So this is all a series of um, discussions that are, being ha that are happening on the local and national level because screening is expensive. But when, when you talk to families, they have their opinions about this as well, especially affected families. So I want to say just a couple of words about the genetics of Fragile X syndrome by a non-geneticist for non-geneticists. So first of all, Fragile X um, is really, uh, as I mentioned, a range of associated disorders, Fragile X associated disorders. It's a family of conditions, all of which are caused by the changes in one gene, FMR1, and that's a gene on the X chromosome. And what happens because of this mutation is there's a change in the pattern of DNA in one part of that gene, and for now, let's just think about that in terms of CGG repeats and CGG. C and G are two of the four nucleotides of DNA. And in every, in every one of us, we have CG repeats in the FMR1 gene. What's normal is for this CGG to be repeated five times, as few as five times or as many as 40 times. And that's all normal. 
In multiple studies, um, it has been shown that the most common number of CGG repeats in the normal population is 30. But it doesn't really matter as much as we know if someone has 28 or 18 or 38, um, those are within the normal range. When you pass 40 CGG repeats, that's when the gene becomes unstable. And from 41 re CGG repeats to more, it can become unstable and passed from one generation to the next in an increasing, usually increasing um, number. So if your parent has 28 CGG repeats, the child inherits 28 CGG repeats. But if the parent has 45 CGG repeats, the child may, uh, may inherit a greater number of CGG repeats because the um, this region of the gene expands, and that's what's causing all of the, the associated disorders with Fragile X syndrome. So one of the things that has been very well established is that there's increasing genetic impact with more CGG repeats. So if you look at this, um, this little figure here, normal, um, normal number of CGG repeats, as I said, is between 5 and 40, and there's no clinical um, phenotype associated with that number of CGG repeats. From 41 to 54, there, that's what's called the gray zone, and it, there's, some people think that there are clinical symptoms in the gray zone, but most people don't. It's an open question, and I have some ideas about how to address that. Um, the premutation um, is between 55 and 200 CGG repeats, so th this is quite a bit expanded um, from what's normal in the population. And there are clinical symptoms at the premutation. There is disagreement about what those clinical symptoms are. Um, and then the full mutation has 200 or more CGG repeats. And when you reach the point of having 200 CGG repeats, the protein that's made by this gene um, isn't made anymore. The gene stops producing the protein. And that has an adverse effect on brain development. So here's a published three-generation example. The grandfather had um, 52 CGG, so he was in the gray zone. He, of course, had no idea that he was carrying any kind of genetic problem. Um, his daughter had 56 CGGs, and she didn't realize she had a problem until her son was born, the grandson of the grandfather. And he has Fragile X syndrome, and he has 538 CGGs. So this becomes this huge expansion within the gene um, once it hits um, uh, 200. And that, that's what can happen in three generations. However, in fact, there has been no population study of the rate of expansion from the gray zone to the premutation to the full mutation. And that's part of the reason why there is controversy about whether it should be screened for. Because if it took 10 generations, you, you're alarming families with no reason. If it takes, if it's on average takes three generations, you have important biological information for this family. And since there's never been a, a population-based study of how fast this happens, this is all theoretical. So I want to say a few more words about the premutation. Um, the estimates based on three recently published papers, two of which came from our group, um, which are based on, which these are based on um, biobanks, so not out of clinics, but out of um, populations of community members who have agreed to donate their DNA for research. We think that there are about a million um, or more premutation carriers in the United States. So, Children with the premutation not, tend not to um, be diagnosed. They, tend, they often have symptoms, but they're not necessarily, they tend not to be diagnosed with um, a premutation. And um, they don't get identified, these children with the premutation, until there's someone else in the family who has the full mutation of Fragile X syndrome, and then the whole family is tested. And then they find out that some of the kids have the premutation as well. Adult women with the premutation ha are at risk of, um, as I said, having a child with Fragile X syndrome, and there are other risks that women face, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then there's this controversial, th then there are, um, there's inconsistent results, which leads to the controversy about whether the premutation is also associated with motor problems, with cognitive problems, with psychiatric problems, and with reproductive problems. Because people, adults with the premutation often have some percentage of those problems, but the um, severity is variable and the number of problems they have is variable. So there's just tremendous heterogeneity in this population. And, and it, there are some people who do not believe that this is worthy of public, public health screening because the symptoms are so variable. And other people feel that it's essential to identify this for the reasons that we've talked about. <clears throat> 
So this is um, an expansion of the table I showed you before. It's the same symptoms that we looked at for the full mutation, but now th these data are on the premutation, and you can see that some of the same symptoms occur for the premutation males and females, and we won't go through these, um, but the, the symptoms tend to be less frequent than in the full mutation, and the symptoms are less frequent in females with the premutation than males with the premutation. However, the females with the premutation and males have um, high, about a third of them have anxiety, and females with the premutation, about 27 percent of them have depression. And so you see that there are, there are some psychiatric risks of, that are experienced or psychiatric symptoms that are experienced by some um, females with a premutation, and those are significant symptoms to experience. Um, in 2002, the, it was really groundbreaking um, research published by a couple in California, Randy and Paul Hagerman, um, and they, they called this irrefutable evidence, and I think people agree that it's irrefutable evidence, that um, people with the, free, the premutation have elevated risks of two constellations of symptoms. One is called fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome, which affects about 30 to 40 percent of males with the premutation over the age of 50, and about half that number of females over the age of 50. And this is some cognitive deficits, some tremors, some gait ataxia, or gait instability, neuropathy, um, and some brain atrophy. So this, this is I think well accepted risk of having the premutation later in life, but it only affects a portion of individuals with the premutation, and few women with the premutation, only about 15 percent. Um, about 20 women with the premut 20 percent of the women with the premutation have what's called fragile X primary ovarian insufficiency, which are reproductive symptoms. They have earlier menopause. Um, 20 percent of them several years earlier than the norm, and in fact, it turns out that the premutation is the largest single genetic cause of um, infertility and early menopause that's known to the reproductive community. But as I said, there's mixed evidence for elevated rates of depression, anxiety, anxiety and other health problems that are associated with the premutation, like fibromyalgia or thyroid dysfunction. So there's a lot of controversy, and until this controversy about whether the premutation is a clinical condition is resolved, I don't think we're going to make that much headway in terms of um, decisions about whether we should be screening for this condition or not. The reason is all genetic screens for the full mutation of Fragile X will pick up the premutation carriers and those in the gray zone. And some people feel that identifying carriers of a non-clinical condition like the gray zone has ethical implications, or even identifying carriers of a disease of the premutation where the disease is not going to be manifested until people in their, in their 40s and 50s in any kind of clinically impairing way to identify those individuals as babies carry some eth ethical risk risks as well in terms of impacting their lifelong sense of self, their, the family, the, um, you know, the, just the stigma of disability and the, the self-concept. So it's pretty, I mean, in our world in Fragile X, this is a very hot issue. Um, I guess I just said this, so we don't have to say it again. So some of the work that we've been doing has to do with studying the population prevalence of Fragile X syndrome. Other work that we've done has been looking at the intergenerational um, um, family impacts of having an fMR1 uh, mutation, a mutation in this gene. So this is that. Um, pedigree that I showed you before. So I just want to go a little bit further um, into this, because it, it, it's complicated, but it really tells the story in, a, I think, a quite vital way. So this is the child who's in our study. Um, and he has intellectual disability, learning disabilities. He has cerebral palsy. Um, he has Fragile X syndrome. Uh, the full mutation of Fragile X syndrome is signified by a blue um, color, coloring in the square or the circle. And so when you work backwards from Mark, um, so his his mother, Lucy, um, had three, has three siblings, and after Mark was diagnosed, Lucy was tested, and she was found to have the premutation, which is the, the red um, coloring there. And then it turned out her sister, Haley, who also was um, willing to be tested, well, she also carried the, um, the, the premutation, and her brother, Lucas, was never tested, and her sister, Brooke, refused to be tested. So this is another thing that happens in families, is that it's not there's not consensus about how to handle this. And some people, some individuals in a family say they want to be tested, and others say, I don't want to know anything about it. One of the difficulties is, is that sometimes 
even people who don't want to be tested find out that they carry the, the mutation. This is not unique to Fragile X. This is true for inherited disorders. And in, in Brooke's case, she did not want to be tested, but she, had a, she has a daughter. And when her daughter had children, both of the children were found to have the full mutation of Fragile X syndrome, and one of them also had autism. And so then Rosie knew, I mean, she was tested. She found out she, the mother of these two kids, she was a carrier, premutation carrier. And then even though Brooke, the grandmother of these two kids, didn't want to be tested, she knows that she is a premutation carrier. And so sometimes people, even the refusal of a family member to be tested ends up in knowledge of their genetic status. Um, so then in the grandchild generation of the original parents, all four grandchildren who were born thus far are affected, three by Fragile X syndrome, one by the premutation, and two of the children with Fragile X also have autism. So when you think about the cascade of disability in this family, these, this couple, Charlotte and Cooper, had no idea what would happen. And you know, it's pictures like this that, le that bring the, um, the dynamic discussion about whether to, to have screening for Fragile X syndrome to light. Um, fragile X syndrome, I mentioned, was uh, associated with a, a tremor and an ataxia syndrome, fax test. And you know, the, the, this family doesn't seem to be having um, that kind of difficulty. But in other families and other pedigrees from our s study, you'll see lots of instances of Parkinson's disease that was misdiagnosed as Parkinson's. It really was fax test. So there's, there's a range of issues that can be discovered by knowing this, that one is a carrier of this genetic disorder, but it's severely underdiagnosed. Um, and the other thing I want to mention um, that I haven't said thus far is that the research, the clinical research on Fragile X syndrome, um, as well as the biological research, is really biased toward individuals who end up being seen in specialized clinics and are diagnosed with this condition, um, and then from family members from those individuals. There are huge numbers of p children with Fragile X syndrome who, who are just said to have intellectual disability. And there are many, 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 many more um, individuals with the premutation and the gray zone of that, um, of that muta uh, with gray zone mutations who uh, no one knows anything about them because they're not, they don't know they have it and um, they, they've not found themselves um, connected to a clinic where this kind of research is being done. So that, therefore, we don't know how much of the research literature generalizes to the community population who have this disorder. Um, I mentioned that about 40% of the males and about um, half that number of females with Fragile X have autistic disorder, and there's a lot of interest in autism. Um, and there's also debate about whether autism in the context of Fragile X is the same autism when it's not in the context of Fragile X. And I'm not going to show you much j data, just one graph, but we find that it's different, um, that when you have Fragile X and autism co-occurring, it's in some ways a bigger challenge. So this is showing behavior problems um, of individuals who have Fragile X only, and those are the blue bars. Uh, fragile X co-occurring autism are the red bars, and then just the green ones are autism only without Fragile X. And you could see that for all types of behavior problems, those with both Fragile X and autism have um, higher, significantly higher behavior problems, and the black line is where it's clinically significant, and there's, there's just more burden of behavior problems in of all types in co-occurring Fragile X and autism. Um, I mentioned about severe aggression, sending about a third of the parents, caregivers of children with Fragile X to seek medical attention because of the severe aggression. And there are other types of behavior problems that are common. And then when a child becomes an adolescent or an adult who's stronger and bigger, it, managing the behavior problems is difficult. So now I'm going to show you another movie of a child. Um, again, the movie was supplied by Liz Berry Kravis. And this movie shows a child with co-occurring autism and Fragile X. I don't think so. Are, are you crabby? I think you're crabby. Michael, you need to have quiet hands. Yeah, that's the beauty. You need to stop. Oh! <laughs> 
So it's hard to look at, but the, and this is, this is fragile X and autism together. So the last part of what I want to talk to you about today has to do with the impact of behavior problems and fragile X syndrome on the family. Um, this is something that I'm very interested in, the, how having a family member with a developmental disability changes the life course of the family. And for this part of um, our study, we use the daily diary methodology. And um, daily diary methodology is where you can get really microscopic information about the daily life of a family through this approach, which I'll tell you about. And we applied this in the lives of our study of um, adolescents and uh, families of adolescents and adults with Fragile X syndrome. And in the daily diary study, we collected daily data for eight consecutive days on mothers of children with Fragile X, pre-mutation carrier mothers of kids with Fragile X. We measured their daily stress. We also measured the positive things that happened to them during the day. We collected saliva, um, and from that we measured their cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And we also measured the daily, we asked the mothers about the daily behavior problems of their um, son or daughter with Fragile X syndrome. And we were interested in looking at the relationship between daily stress and cortisol. So as I said, on eight consecutive days, um, mothers were telephoned in the evening. This was a 15-minute um, telephone survey. It was conducted by the Survey Center of Penn State University, and we use Penn State University because they were the home of a large nationally representative study um, of um, Americans, and they used this daily diary methodology. And so we imported this methodology into our study so that we could have really good comparison groups of unaffected individuals. Um, and so, as I said, this 15-minute um, call asked how the mother spent her time, the minutes and hours spent on various activities, um, positive events, stresses, um, her mood, her physical health. And the only thing we added to the daily, to the daily diary interviews was measures of behavior problems. Um, so they were identical to the nationally representative sample. And on days two, three, four, and five, saliva was collected um, by these mothers. Um, and the way they collected their saliva is they collected some saliva before they got out of bed, 30 minutes later after getting out of bed, a second sample was collected, and then right before lunch and right before, right before bedtime. So there are four saliva samples each day. They collected salivas on these little sal saliva sa samples on these little salivates, like when you go to the dentist and they s stick that between your teeth and your, gu your, your gum and your cheek. That's what the salivates were collected on, and they were collected in these test tubes um, that we supplied for them, again, based on this um, national study called Midas Midlife in the US. And um, uh, we were able to identify a tremendously um, uh, well-matched comparison group from the large national sample. We matched them on mother's education and income and marital status, having a child still living at home, but not, no children with disabilities. And so we were able to sort of have this tremendously controlled comparison between mothers of children with fragile X and their daily life and um, mothers of non-disabled children and their daily life, as well as the differences in their um, stress uh, their physiological level of stress. So first let me tell you about how the daily life differed between mothers of kids with Fragile X syndrome who are in the blue bars and mothers in the comparison group who did not have children with disabilities. So some of the questions asked about fatigue and how, what percentage of the, day, of the days, the eight days in the study did you report fatigue and about 40%, the mothers of um, children with Fragile X syndrome reported fatigue in about 40% of the days and you see that's substantially higher percentage than mothers of children without disabilities. And similarly, mothers of children with Fragile X syndrome reported um, intrusions into their workday um, quite f frequently on about a quarter of the workdays, and that's, again, much higher than the comparison group, which is, I think, 8% 8, 8 of the workdays. So you think about the impact on sort of the economy of having or your own career of having these intrusions coming on a quarter of the days. Um, and then we also, as part of this paradigm, measured arguments and avoided arguments. We all know what avoided arguments are, right? Um, but they're stressful, too, even though they're avoided. And you see a significantly higher percentage of the mothers of children with Fragile X syndrome reported having an argument that day and also avoiding an argument that day than um, mothers of children in the comparison group. Um, we also measured the percentage of days that their mothers experienced stress at work or stress at home, or what we called network stress, which is stress in the lives of people, and our loved ones, our friends, and our family members. And for all three of these types of stresses, mothers of kids with Fragile X syndrome reported significantly more days on which they were stressed than mothers in the comparison group. 
course, we don't know whether premutation carriers of, mother, of children with fragile X syndrome are partly responding this way because of their biology or par all because of the stress of having a child with a disability, but I will tell you that we've had, um, we use the same paradigm in mothers of children with um, autism and their levels of stress is even higher um, of all types of stress. So mothers of kids with autism show greater divergence from the comparison group than the fragile X. Um, we, we looked at the percentage of mothers who reported at least one episode of child behavior problems during the eight-day diary study, and you see that 84% of them reported at least one episode. 14% reported episodes every day, um, episodes of child behavior problems every day. So just think back to that movie. Think about whether that was every day. But you see that only 16% said that they had no days without, um, with, when their child during that diary period um, was not... Um, manifesting any behavior problems. So behavior problems in this sample was, you know, very, very prevalent in this, as measured within an eight-day period. And the type of behavior problem, you know, they varied in prevalence, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but a couple of points, the males are in blue, and you can see that males have more behavior problems of all types than females with fragile X syndrome, and the most prevalent was um, unusual and repetitive behaviors, and so I'm going to zero it on that um, for a minute. And they were experienced on more than 40% of the days for the mothers of the boys and um, about, I don't know, 18% the mothers of the girls. So the, the last movie I'm going to show you, again from Liz Barry Kravis, shows an adolescent with fragile X syndrome. Um, and he's got a lot of these unusual and repetitive behaviors. So I wanted to show you these because these are the most prevalent of the types of behavior problems that are manifested by um, children and adolescents and adults with fragile X syndrome. Here you see a larger child, I mean an adolescent, and this is without sound. There's no sound in this movie. And he's walking with someone else. And he's touching the walls. And he has that repetitive behavior. And so when you think about being out in the community, it's, it's stigmatizing, it's hard to control, it's upsetting. Um, I'm not sure he's upset, but these are the challenges that, that families have. So if I were to summarize the daily life of premutation carrier mothers of adolescents and adults with fragile X syndrome that we studied using this daily diary paradigm, clearly there's more fatigue and more intrusions into their workday. They have more arguments with people. They also report avoiding more arguments um, than the comparison group, and they experience significantly more stress of all types that were measured. And they have high levels of exposure to behavior problems manifested by the son or daughter with fragile X syndrome. And this naturally leads to the last question that I want to talk about, which is, what is the physiological effect of all of this, of this level of daily stress? Um, this is highly intensive. It has lasted in our sample for many years because we're studying mothers of adolescents and adults with fragile X syndrome. Um, and so again, we, we're very interested in cortisol because it is a stress hormone and it can give us a sense of the physiological signature of this level of stress exposure. And as I mentioned, we took four saliva samples each day for four days. So we were able to measure cortisol um, as it um, started out before getting out of bed as it typically rose um, early in the morning and as it declined during the day on days two, three, four, and five. And the neat thing about this paradigm is that on day one, there may have been exposure to behavior problems, and then we could measure the cortisol on day two. So we could really sort out the temporal order, the time order of ex stress exposure and then physiological response across the days of the diary study and lag it out. And, you know, we asked the question, what is the effect of exposure to child behavior problems yesterday on the mother's awakening level of cortisol the next morning? And we were interested in that first moment the next morning because it was before she got out of bed, presumably before new stresses were experienced during the second day. And we divided our sample of premutation pre carrier mothers into two groups on the basis of their activation ratio. So remember, that's the percentage of cells with a mutation that are turned on, um, um, the, the fragile X mutation that are premutation in this case that are turned on. And a low activation ratio, um, those mothers have a smaller percentage of cells expressing the normal X and more abnormal cells. And a high activation ratio is the reverse, a greater percentage of cells um, that are expressing the normal allele 
And this is what the normal rhythm of cortisol looks like during the day on average, um, where you know, whatever level it is, they start out before getting out of bed at this level. 30 minutes later, there is the morning rise, which gives us the energy for tackling the day's challenges. And during the course of the day, there is a decline. And the theory is that having lower cortisol before going to bed allows us to have restful sleep and have restorative sleep. So that's normal. And a question could be asked about what is, what are the various patterns of dysregulation of cortisol? Um, you know, sometimes people think about ex ex exposure to stress, your cortisol level goes up, hyperactivation, and that's this orange line. And chronic stress has been associated in some research with low levels of cortisol, um, and that's this pink line. And then the average line is the one I showed you before. And so we were curious to see whether um, mothers who are exposed to daily stress, which you know, may lead to an acute pattern of um, upregulation of cortisol, and also chronic stress over many years and decades, maybe that's l more like a chronic st stress, stress exposure. We didn't know what we would see in terms of this particular group who were exposed to both chronic stress and acute stress. Um, and I'll mention that chronic stress has been associated with um, conditions like PTSD and fibromyalgia and depression. Um, and their cortisol is low in those conditions. Um, PTSD, low cortisol, fibromyalgia, low cortisol, and depression as well. So we found that the answer to our question was it depends on activation ratio. And it's really a remarkable separation um, of um, responses in, and these are um, multi-level statistical models for the statisticians in the room. So here you have the number of behavior problems yesterday. And as we went from a good day yesterday to a worse and worse day yesterday, then mothers with low activation ratio and those with high activation ratio diverged in their cortisol response at that waking up point before they got out of bed. So high activation ratio, which is a you know, larger percentage of normal cells, responded more or less normally to a bad day in their child's life yesterday. That the, more, the greater the number of behavior problems yesterday, the higher, the higher the level of cortisol the mother had the next morning. But mothers with a low activation ratio, meaning a lower percentage of the normal cells, the greater the number of behavior problems the previous day, the lower the level of cortisol um, that those mothers experienced the subsequent morning. And so they were really quite different because of this one biomarker in their res physiological response to stress. Um, and since low cortisol has been linked with a number of um, health problems, some of, some of which are elevated in premutation carrier mothers anyway, it's important to, to recognize that these mothers with the low percentage of normal cells are particularly vulnerable to symptoms that then um, um, show up in premutation carriers. So I'd like to end um, and summarize a few points. One is that um, these fMR1 expansions are prevalent, but they're significantly underdiagnosed. That Fragile X syndrome um, has many co-occurring conditions, um, and, but variable manifestation of those co-occurring co conditions. And autism and severe aggression are particularly problematic. Behavior problems are a significant factor that interfere with the quality of life of the family. But um, some of that depends upon the biological vulner or genetic vulnerability of the mother, the premutation carrier. Premutation carriers are much higher prevalence than Fragile X syndrome and gray zone even more so. And as I mentioned, the, those with um, a lower percentage of normal cells, the mothers with lower percentage of the normal cells are particularly vulnerable. And we saw those intergenerational family impacts. But I don't want to leave on a negative note, because this is the self-report data of the families to that large study that Don Bailey conducted. And he asked, overall, thinking about the impact of Fragile X on your family, has it been mostly positive, somewhat positive, somewhat negative, and mostly negative? And despite um, the challenges that these families face. 18% uh, said mostly positive and 35% said, said somewhat positive. So it's, it's a very important to sort of get inside the head of the family, the eyes of the family, the experience of the family when ascertaining whether this genetic condition, which has very significant effects, and these are parents of kids with full mutation fragile X, whether that's experienced in that negative way. So I'm going to leave you with questions. Should we screen for instability in this gene, either at birth or prenatally or at preconception? And here are the pros and cons as I see them, and then you can tell me what you think. Um, 
So the pros are that it's informing families about their own genetics, which I think you know, we like to know about ourselves. Um, it may help in family planning. Um, we can provide services to children who need services at a younger age, and we may be able to redu reduce the cost through those services um, to society. In other words, if we provide the right services, then children with fragile X syndrome will be less dependent um, for, on services for their entire life, at least in theory. The cons are very, very significant expense in screening all babies for a rare condition. Um, the more prevalent forms of fragile X, the premutation in the gray zone are definitely clinically more variable and less um, affecting, and should we be identifying babies who won't have symptoms and serious symptoms until later in life? And are we over-medicalizing a prevalent genetic condition? I mean, if 12% of, if one in 12 women and one in 24 men have this, if we diagnose, is, is that over-medicalizing this condition? So I'm gonna leave you with that question. And with that, acknowledge my collaborators, all of whom worked on this project with me, and also um, Don Bailey for supplying the data from Our Fragile X World, Elizabeth Barry Kravis for the movies, Dave Almeida, who was the principal investigator of the um, Daily Diary study and collaborated um, with us on this, and Pam Hurd, who provided some of the resources for population level assessment and our funding sources. So with that, thank you very much.